certain traditional things about celebrating Holy Communion that we can't yet do. Um, which is why we invite you to make use of the uh, cups and wafers that were available at the door for celebrating communion. If you got by the door without that, will you please raise your hand or let someone know as the uh, ushers pass around now and they will give you elements so that you can share with us uh, later in the service when we come to that gem down here. One of the things that is actually prescribed from the very earliest times of the Christian liturgy, gathering for Holy Communion, is that the believers in assembly greet one another with the kiss of peace. And it's actually specified the kiss of peace. I'm sorry I can't encourage you to do that, because I think kissing is actually a very nice thing. Um, but I would invite and encourage you now to stand, and with all those around you, and if you want to circulate, that's good too. Share with each other signs of peace. Oh, 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 
earth maker, life giver, pain bearer, source of all that is and all that shall be. Father, I am the Father of us all. Love the Father of all that you will be in heaven. In the hallowed of your name, and echoed through the universe. May your heavenly will be known by all creatures, great and small. And may your common love, peace, and freedom sustain our hope to end the world. With the bread we need this day, forgive us. For the hurt we inflict on one another, forgive us. Through times of temptation, strengthen us. And try us to pray to the Lord, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For we reign in the glory of the power that is love. prayers today, let us remember Lion Graff, who passed away suddenly and unexpectedly last week, praying for his parents, Brooke Graff and Jen Graff, his children, and all who grieve his death. Let us continue in remembrance of Mary Mayo, and David, and Jonathan, and all who grieve Mary's death. Let us raise up prayers of thanksgiving for the availability of COVID vaccines. The knowledge we have to fight the virus and for the significantly reduced rate of transmission here in this county. Well done. We offer prayers for all of those small businesses in our community who are struggling because they can't find enough workers because so much has been upset and displaced over the last year and a half, and they are in danger of losing their livelihoods. Let us remember in prayer those in our community who are without shelter as the temperatures drop and autumn arrives. And let us pray for our brother Milton Habit and his brother Ted, had a stroke last week. Are there other joys or concerns, thanksgivings or petitions that any of you would share with us as we prepare to pray? Stephen Gore recovering from surgery. Did Stephen have surgery? I was out of town for a few days, but I didn't know about that. Stephen Brewer, who recently had surgery. That dog, I saw him last Sunday, and he didn't say anything to me. The joys of welcoming students back to campus. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. <laughs> yes, it is a joy to welcome students back and have you all in our midst. A real joy. Curtis. A great pleasure. Thank you. Curtis asked us to remember in our prayers the Apache Reservation where he often offers service. And let's remember many of our First People populations and communities who are struggling even more than others in these difficult times. Patty asks us to pray with her with thanksgiving and um, for courage in her grandmother's continuing recovery. So let us pray. Gracious God, in whose image we are made, 
Hear us as we pray in gratitude for all that you have done for us. For all that you are doing in us. And for all that you will do through us. Open our eyes to see your presence moving powerfully with love and courage for justice and for peace. Open our ears to hear familiar words in new ways that will change us and challenge us to become the people you created us to be. Grant us the power and the courage to come out of the darkness into the light of your love, unashamed, unafraid, bold and resolved to live into the fullness that you intend for us, serving you by serving others. We pray you hear our joys and concerns, our thanksgivings and petitions. All that we have spoken aloud and those that now well up in the silences of our hearts. Through your loving spirit, empower us and all for whom we have prayed, that in our joys and in our concerns we may be witnesses to your justice, mercy, and peace that work in our lives and in all creation. God of many names and surpassing truth, we ask this in trust of the one we know, the gift of your fullness. Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Amen. this reading from the Gospel of Mark. Some Pharisees came to test him and asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed us to write a certificate of dis dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. I think I heard a little, a little confusion, pushback, teeth grinding, a few other things like that. Maybe even the temperature in the room went up ever so slightly. I've been at this for a while. And one of the things I know, after doing this for a while now, is that 
people's understandings about marriage and things like that is all over the map. <laughs> Even in a community like this one, in a gathering such as this, where you would imagine that a lot of people are coming from the same place, I think not. <laughs> And so, if you can trust me and each other, and I really don't want to lose my notes, I would like to have a little bit of fun with you and just start out by asking you this question. Where does marriage come from? And you may be a little reluctant or reticent, like I'm going to say something wrong, or I'm going to say something that mm, is uncool, or I'm going to say something that might potentially hurt somebody else's feelings, or I'm going to say something that um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to answer for over coffee uh, <laughs> after worship. Look, that's not how we are. We're here as friends engaging each other in the search for the guidance and presence of the living God in our lives and how to understand that. We're going to be nice to each other, and we're going to make room for this to happen. Where does marriage come from? Tradition. It comes from tradition. Okay. But aren't there lots of different traditions of marriage? I mean, there are some traditions of plural marriage, right? There are some traditions of hierarchical and authoritarian marriage. There are some traditions of marriage that don't look too good to me, but are very traditional. Yeah. So, but. A lot of it comes from tradition. Another way of saying that is, it's a cultural invention. And there are lots of different cultures. Where else do you think marriage comes from? I think marriage comes from man, not God. Comes from man, not God. So it's a product of culture. Anybody want to say marriage comes from Pat, hi, welcome, <laughs> and thanks. Yeah, Pat says that marriage is perhaps the closest we get to understanding the nature and substance of the relationship between Christ and the church, between God and how God loves us. Yeah. That's a very traditional understanding in the Christian tradition, or parts of the Christian tradition. What else do we know about marriage? Yes? I, I guess I really didn't need my notes today, except for like, yes. Let me, let me boil that down, if I might, into this bite. Marriage is committing yourself to take the awesome risk of love. The awesome risk of love. In a complex world with another changing human being. And determining that you will make your way. That you will shape your future by your shared commitment to that loving. And boy, that's a risk. What else do we know about marriage? George. 
It's a, it's a way of biological selection. Thank you, George. I think that's so. Yeah? Well, I'll just say, like, I think the comment was really fantastic, but uh, it, it makes sense. It's, it's a practical means economically, emotionally, for uh, bringing the next generation along. It's a practical means economically and emotionally. Huh. Why, then, is the rate of marriage in such a steep decline and has become over the last generation so class specific? I mean, I, I think we all know what you're talking about, right? It, and, 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 and we think that way. It, it has become normative because it's a unit that makes sense to us as the core of family. And, and, and growing family. But the practicalities of it may be culturally specific. Can you explain how it's class specific now? Um, uh, uh, marriage is a declining phenomenon in all segments of American culture except for the upper middle class. I mean, that's just statistics. What else do we know about marriage? But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Is that marriage? Anybody know the story that's being referred to here? What is the first commandment that humankind receive in Scripture? If you take, if you take the Bible in canonical order, right? What's, what's the first commandment? The first time. Say it louder. Be fruitful. Thank you. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Be fruitful and multiply, right? And that's not just an enjoining to procreation, right? That is about, I have given you this magnificent creation. Do something with it. Make it flourish. And this is said to the biblical Adam and Eve, which is kind of problematic to begin with, in terms of a paradigm relationship. I, 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 I had, a, I had a, a largely unchurched friend ask me once, so if the biblical narrative is correct, if the product of the first generation is all incest, right? It was like, oh, well, yeah, I guess so. I don't think there's actually very much of a model for marriage that any of us would like anywhere in the Bible. And there are several of them. And I don't think there are any that we would particularly like to live in. Marriage is quite problematic now, and it has always been so. What is it? Who is it for? What is it for? Why does it matter? So, in this context, Jesus' teaching about divorce often causes a lot of confusion and trouble. And for that reason, many people will try to ignore it. I have to admit it's more complicated and troubling for me now than it was the last time I delved into this subject before gay people had legal access to marriage, and before I had been, six years ago, essentially, divorced. We need to understand Jesus' words against the background of laws concerning divorce in his day. In the traditional Jewish community, families were the initiator of marriage. The contract was as much economic as anything else. And men were the only ones who had the option 
to divorce. Women, by and large, did not have the legal or economic means to separate from their husbands. And being divorced from a man was almost always a differential power relationship. The man was almost always, invariably the same, the more powerful partner. And a woman had no real claim on the marital assets, and her former husband had no continuing responsibility for her welfare. So in this context, Jesus' words, which may sound harsh and restrictive to our ears, should be understood as a call to justice. It's part of our ongoing recognition of this fullness for which we were made. Pharisees were asking a legal question, mostly in an effort to trip up Jesus, to get him to say something in politic, a sound bite that could be used against him on the evening news. And he answered them with a new idea. This new idea that we find in Jesus' controversy with the Pharisees, the notion that a woman might have rights in a marriage and protections in a divorce is a controversy in Jewish contact with Greco-Roman culture and the status of women in Roman law. Politically, the Pharisees aren't really asking Jesus a question about divorce or marriage, faithfulness or righteousness. They're trying to get him to say something that makes it sound as if he's sympathetic to Rome the foreign colonizers of Israel. They're trying to bait him in their culture wars and trick him into giving up a sound point so he'll seem unpatriotic. And what we find here is what we see throughout the Gospels. Jesus answers the arguments about legal issues with his witness to the truth of God's love as the substance of all faithful relationships. Over and over with regard to money and charity, food, sex, children, family, religion, ritual purity, all of it, the law matters, but not as an end in itself. The law is God's gift to guide and serve relationships that are loving and just. It's the quality of the relationships that matters. It's so important to pay attention to how and where Jesus locates his response to the Pharisees. Jesus answers them first by pointing to the law. What did Moses command? That is, what does the law say? And they report what is written in Deuteronomy, the conditions for a legal divorce. Jesus acknowledges that the Mosaic Law, what grew out of the Ten Commandments, permitted divorce. But only because of the hardness of heart of the people. He says that the law regulates their hard hearts. And then he puts scripture in conversation with scripture, pointing to a time before the law, an ideal of God's intention expressed in creation itself. The Pharisees ask about divorce, and Jesus changes the subject to the nature of marriage as a creative partnership, a creative relationship. The message here is Jesus saying to those in his time and in ours that people are more than bodies. Real love is never casual. And human beings are not disposable. Of course, it's all a lot more complicated than that. But finally, it isn't. That's the bottom line. 
Relationships are more than mere convenience. Real love is ever casual. Human beings are not disposable. People are more than just bodies. The lure of evil is to choose things to objectify reality, to define your existence by stuff, by your convenience and your consumption, your conformity to the standards of your class. It's one of the great struggles of our age, one of the great evils of our time. Everything has become a commodity. Even you and me. Everything has become a commodity in the great scheme that makes the world work. And Jesus says, no. Even the law can be perverted in this way. Made into a tool that those with more power can bend the less powerful to their will. Of such stuff, revolutions are made. People get married for all sorts of reasons. But there's only one reason I know of that makes it a joy to stay there. Mutual recognition with a partner that you are called together to multiply the goodness of life. To increase the sum of creativity in creation. And thereby to glorify God. That's something available to all of us all the time in all of our relationships. And the notion that marriage is a search for that truth. A commitment to the awesomeness of love. We live into this calling through generous lives, risking and finding the truth that it is in giving that we receive and pardoning that we are pardoned. We live into this calling by allowing love to turn the memory of brokenness and injury into new life, opportunity, and hope. We live into this calling, following the way of Christ, who, as far as we know, never married. But for us and for our salvation, embraced all creation as beloved. Even you and me. To the glory of God. I want to make sure one last time that everyone has communion elements. Yes? Please? As we join in the communion celebration, we answer the call of God, who invites each one of us by name and gathers us together in the unity of Christ. From workplace and classroom, 
in physical space or online, from struggle and from repose, we are called into God's presence, young and old and middle-aged, individuals and families, married and not, soft-spoken and outspoken. God is calling us by name to join in the feast of salvation. In this place and moment, let us seek God's vision for all people, unity and joy expressed through countless gifts brought together into fullness in communion with Christ. So let us now prepare this table with our offerings, giving ourselves and what we have so that we too may be consecrated in his service. The ushers will come forward now to receive our offerings. <laughs> close to us as breathing and distant as the farthest star. We thank you for your constant love for all you have made. We thank you for all that sustains life, for all people of faith in every generation who have given themselves to your will, and especially for Jesus Christ, whom you have sent from your own being as our Savior. We praise you for Christ's birth and life, his sacrifice unto death and his resurrection, and for the calling forth of Christ's church and our mission in the world. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and giving thanks to God, he broke it and said, this is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
And after the supper, he poured one final cup of wine. Again, giving thanks to God, he shared it with his friends and said, Bring this, all of you. This is my blood in the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so for the remembrance. Gracious God, we ask you to bless this bread and cup and all of us with the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. In our eating and drinking of these elements, may our eyes be opened that we may recognize the risen Christ in our midst, in each other, in all for whom Christ gave his life.
As you're able, I invite you to stand and join together in this prayer of thanksgiving. God of all goodness, we thank you for the nourishment of our faith and the renewal of our lives through this communion in Christ. So send us now into the world as instruments of your peace. Where there is hate, let us so love. Where there is injury, where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O God, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to each other. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior.
make me anything.